Our kids are dismissed to their classes at this moment. <clears throat> As they're dismissed to their classes, I'll ask you to open your Bibles to the book of First Peter, First Peter chapter 1. And I'll ask you to stand in a moment, but I want to share something with you that I want to do before I preach. First Peter chapter 1. Inside of your outlines, you should have received one of these cards inside of your outlines. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is an election year, <laughs> if you noticed that. And this year, there's going to be a whole lot of amendments on the ballot. And as, as a shepherd, as a representative of the one who is on his throne, I think that I have a responsibility, well, I don't think, I know that I have a responsibility to instruct the church in truth around certain things that are unquestionably either good or evil. And this particular amendment, there's a, there's a sign out there in the front of the church. I hope every Oviedo citizen has to drive down this road and multiple times, hopefully, and that they will see no on four. This is a deceptive, deceptive law. And unfortunately, as you, as you remember a few weeks back where I played the video of Josh Howley, who's a pastor of a church somewhere, I don't know where, but he shared, he said, it is not that um, the church has become more political, it's that politics have become more theological. And so what has happened is we are, the, uh, the, the, the political atmosphere is shifting into a realm it should not and when it does that the church pastors in particular are responsible to sound the whistle to sound the alarm and say hey guys hold on a second time out this is not a question of uh, do, do you like me do you not like me do you agree with this do you not agree with this what does God's word say about these things that, 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 that's where we have to be on stuff Listen, I, I, don't, I don't care who you like as a person or a personality. I'm not here to convince you of, of any of that stuff. That ain't got nothing to do with Amendment 4. If you want to know my personal opinions, you can check out my Facebook. You'll see them there. I'm pretty clear. If you want to have a conversation, we can talk about it. I have no problem with that. But, but this Amendment 4, I just, I just want to point out to you that you see there what it, what, what it, what it, what it means. And, and this is why this is so important on this issue, because w when, when, you look at, when, when you look at all the statistics of, of what people are voting for, what's motivating them to vote, right? They're going to say the most important thing. I think it's like 39% of people say that, 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 that the economy is like that. 39% are like, that's the most important. And then, and then the next one is immigration. And right under it is the issue of abortion or what has been termed reproductive health. It's another lie. It's just another deception, that's all it is. It's just a prettying up something to say, we wanna legally murder as many babies as we can. That's what this is. And listen, I, I am not here to condemn or make anybody feel shame if you have undergone an abortion, if you have had that, Jesus, go, go back and listen to my message that I preached on abortion a few uh, months back, and you will see, man, I believe Jesus is there every step of the way with a woman as she's going through all of those things. But when, when we have an option and we have an opinion, I, and, and I, I, th this is why this is important for us. I, I want you to understand this. In this nation, there are approximately 90 million evangelicals. 90 million evangelicals. Now, that's a lot of people. If you got 90 million evangelicals to vote in the same direction, this nation would look totally different. 40 million of those 90 million evangelicals did not vote in 2020. 15 million of those evangelicals are not even registered to vote. Now, we, we as a nation, we, we are an anomaly, right? We, now, other nations, they have this now where some nations are able to vote for their elected officials and for laws and stuff like that. But that's not how it was in the Bible days. That's why you don't have, that's why I can't pick a scripture and say, hey, man, let's, this is what voting. I can't pick that scripture because it's not there. 
But we have a we have a a, a right. We have a responsibility. And I, I don't see my brother Sean. Where is he's probably teaching the kids right now. But Sean and I were talking on Sunday, uh, and we were discussing voting. And I'm gonna and it, what he said was very crude, but I'm gonna repeat it because I think it makes a point. Because there's so many Christians in this moment, just like in 2020, I'm just not going to vote. I'm going to wash my hands with this. I'm not going to engage. These were his words. Too many of us swung on trees for us not to vote. And that's coming from a black man. So I'm repeating his words that sound so crude, but the point is that there is history in this nation where people were not given the rights to vote and, and, and they paid a price to make sure that every one of us could influence the policies of our nation. And so this particular policy is deceptive. And this is why this is so important for us, because what, what, what does it mean? No parental consent. In other words, a child could go to an abortion clinic, to a hospital, and have an abortion, and mom and dad are not required to consent before that happens. How does that make sense? Your kids cannot take aspirin in school without parental consent. But yet, we are going to allow a a young woman to make a life-altering decision, and we're going to exclude mommy and daddy from the conversation. That's what this amendment does. No informed consent, no reflection or waiting period, no health or safety regulations. There was, there was a big stink that was made about this 28-year-old woman who just recently died. She went, she had to go across state lines. You guys have heard the lie because it's a lie the way that they're conveying this. She had to go across state lines because of the Georgia policies regarding abortion after Roe v. Wade was overturned. Praise the Lord for that. After, after the, the, the legislation of each state is given the mandate of deciding, that's why this is on the ballot in Florida, because we have to decide what is our state going to decide in the area of abortion. And so this woman goes to another state to get the pills to have, a, to have a, 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 an abortion. Now, now let, me, let me explain something to you. Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton said this. He said that he wanted abortion to be legal, safe, and rare. That was the position of the Democrat Party 30 years ago. Barack Obama said the same exact thing. He wanted it to be legal, safe, and rare. Can I, can, can, 25% of the women who will use those abortion pills will need medical attention. It's, it's a medical procedure. The reason why this girl died is not because she was denied medical attention. It's because a medical procedure went wrong in her. But we're saying it was because of some, you you, you understand. It's a lie. Don't believe the lies. Please, for the love of God, do research. Don't listen to sound bites. Listen to me. Don't even listen to repetitious interview answered questions. Go and do research. This amendment is terrible. 90 million evangelicals, 40 million didn't vote, 15 million aren't registered to vote. So here's my challenge to you. My challenge to you is to register to vote. Listen, if you don't vote for anything else, vote no on Amendment 4. If you, I I don't care, this to me is protecting our, the most innocent. And ladies, 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 hear me please. I'm all about men and how important we are, and I believe men are important. But women, you need to know, your voice is the most important voice in this battle right now. It's not men. They've already told us to shut up because we don't have a uterus. They've already told us that we don't have an opinion that matters. I think that's a bunch of malarkey, as, as as our president said years ago. I think that's a bunch of garbage, but nonetheless, ladies, you... You have to rise up and be the voice for the most vulnerable. Babies don't have a voice. You're their voice. When we vote, two things I think a vote is, and then we're going to move on and talk about heaven. (laughs) 
two things that I think a vote, a vote is. A vote is a prayer, because when I vote for whatever, I am, I am praying unto the Lord in that moment, Lord, you see what I am standing for, what I am standing against. I'm praying that you, Father, will agree with me. Or better, that I'm in agreement with you, that what I am, what I am voting for, what, who, whatever, whatever I'm supporting or whatever I'm saying no to, whatever, that, you, that I'm with you on this, it is a prayer. But a vote is also a proclamation. Because a vote is you, as a citizen of heaven, saying, my Lord is on a throne, and I have a responsibility to be his representative in this earth, and I need to be the voice. And what I am saying is I am agreeing with the one who is on the throne that this is righteous, that this is good, that that is evil, and that is not good. That's what you're saying. You're proclaiming that. That's what you're doing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please. First Peter chapter 1. And, and, and in fairness, in fairness, if, if, if I have misrepresented it or I said something that was wrong, I humbly ask you, please correct me. Please talk to me. Show me where I am wrong because I want to correct the rec- record because I'm not on that side or this side. I'm on this side. Amen. That's it. First Peter chapter one, verse three, when you got it, say So. so. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in these last times. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, Though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. God, thank you for the blessed hope that we have, for the incorruptible, undefiled inheritance that doesn't fade, that is reserved for us. Thank you, God, for your kingdom that is here now and that is to come in its fullness. In these next few moments, Lord, may you align our minds and align our hearts to your wisdom, to your will, and help us, Lord, to be inspired by the truth that we see in your word regarding our hope of heaven. We thank you for this, Lord, and we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you don't have an outline, please raise your hand so the ushers can get you an outline. Want to be sure that you're able to follow along in the introduction of the message and just keep your hand up and the ushers will. They'll, They'll come and find you and get it to you. But I want you to follow along on the introduction of the message, but not just in the introduction, but I also want you to take some notes, fill in some blanks, I hope that you will, uh, I hope that you have been encouraged as we have been going through this series on Eternity Matters. Uh, And so in your outline there, you see the promise of heaven is about hope. It's about hope. The scripture that we just read, just keep your hand up. The ushers, they'll bring it to you. Make sure they can see your hand. Um, 
the promise of heaven that we just read about, it's about hope. It is about a hope that we have. If you just look at verse one, just look at verse one real quickly. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Our living hope is to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Our, our hope of heaven is something that we have been given because of the resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus rose again, we have this living hope. It's not some dead hope. It's not some fake hope, right? It's, it's a living hope that we have that is, that is in us. And we are, are not just having this hope, but we are kept by the power of God. Our inheritance, our glory, all of that is reserved for us. It is undefiled. It doesn't fall apart. It doesn't fade away. It's kept by God. And then we, by the power of the Spirit, are kept for that inheritance. Hallelujah. That, 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 that's the hope that we have. And here's the thing. When we breathe our last breath, we will go from a living hope to a realized hope. That, that, that's what we're looking for, realized hope, which is what we should look forward to. We should not be living for this hope. Uh, we should be living for this hope above all else. And so I want us to just look at a couple of scriptures here. And, I, and, 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 and this morning, what I'm hoping is that I will um, read more scripture than I will preach. And so I, I want you to see what the scriptures have to say. There, there, there's a much greater preacher than I, and that is the Spirit of God the one who inspired God's word, the one who spoke and moved the prophets of old. And, and, and he gave us these words. And so look with me at the book of Romans chapter eight, very important passage of scripture. Romans chapter eight, verse eight, 18 through 25. Look at the first verse there, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That, that verse messes me up every time I read it. For, for, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of, God's, of God, for the, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in what? In hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know, you know the, 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 the creation, the, the trees, the, the oceans, right? The, all, all that we see all around us is going to be redeemed just like we are. Create, creation is all, all, this, all the natural disasters and all this stuff. That, that is creation groaning and waiting to be, to be incorruptible. That, that, that's creation waiting for, for, for it to experience no more sorrow. It is sorrowing over its condition. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Creation, is that, that, that's what the scripture is telling us here. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance." Filled with hope, the Apostle Paul's writing there to the, to the church in Rome. First Peter, the Apostle Peter, the one that we just read here. First uh, Peter chapter 4, going on later in that book, he says this in chapter, chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. No, no, notice, notice the theme that is there is, is one of suffering and the other of hope. In this life, we're, 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 life is supposed to be hard. <laughs> I know you don't want to hear that. If the only hope that I give you as your pastor is how good your life is going to be, if you just give money, of how good your life is going to be, if you just do everything the Bible says, if that's the only hope that I give you, I failed you. 
Because in this life, you can do every single thing right. You can do every single thing perfectly and you can still experience, not you can, you will still experience hardship, suffering. That is gonna happen no matter how good you are. No matter how undeserving you are of hardship, you're going to experience it in this world. But our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in perfection in this life. Our hope is in the glory that is going to be revealed when Christ is revealed. That is our hope. That is what we are living for. We're not living for utopia now. We're living for eternity. Hello. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 The Apostle Paul, again, writing to a different part of the body of Christ, he writes here, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Anybody feel that, outward man perishing? Some of you young people are like, what y'all talking about? You, 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 yeah, you know. The, the other day, the other day I had a conversation and I was talking, I said, you know, uh, you know, you, you wake up when you're in your forties and you're, and you're like, you woke up and you're like, what did I do when I was sleeping? Because I woke up with a pain that I know I didn't do any, I went to, this pain was not here when I laid down in this bed. That's what you did when you were 20. It just hit you when you were 40. Hello. You know, listen. I, and I know this firsthand because, you know, a lift with your legs. And I'm like, Psh, I don't need that. Let me just yank this thing up right here. Now, yeah, amen. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> now I got to warm up before I pick stuff up, right? It's not, it's not just like, yo, do that. Anyway, I moved too quick. You don't know what could happen. But, but all that said, for our light, verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Thank God it's only for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house made not with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is living hope. That even though we're going through trials, even though we're going through hardship, even though we're feeling suffering, even though our bodies are aching, even though our hearts are broken, even though we are, we have, we have tears and we have sorrow and we have worry and we have cares. We know that there is an eternal weight of glory. There is hope that we have. So here's what I want you to think about this morning. Living hope Living in the hope of the promise of heaven means living differently while on this earth. Living in the hope of the promise of heaven means living differently while on the earth. You know, that's the whole point of this sermon series is for us to live differently now. I'm not just living for the breakthrough that I need now. Listen, I want you to know I prayed this earlier today. In the last couple of weeks, I've been going through a course, and 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 they spoke about this, and I and I might speak on this in more detail, but it's 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 about Christ being in session. Christ is on his throne. He is seated high above principalities and powers. And we are spiritually seated in heavenly places with him. And Jesus is executing his judgments, his purposes in this earth even now. And so there are plenty, and many of us in this room have experienced breakthroughs in the natural, healings in the natural. Things have happened as we are like, wow, God has moved in a mighty way. That is beautiful. And I love those things, but our hope is more than that. Because if he doesn't break you through, if he doesn't bring you into that thing, if he doesn't do that thing for you, guess what's still coming? Heaven. So we live differently because even if on this side of heaven, I don't see everything I want to see, I know that I'm looking forward to a day when I'm going to see more than I ever imagined I would see. That is what heaven is about for us. So the first thing I want to ask you to repeat after me is this, say, we should expect to rejoice Rejoice. in the immediate immediate. presence of God. God. We should expect to rejoice in the immediate presence 
presence of God. And now you're probably um, still at, at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so you should still be there. It's, it's actually 2 Corinthians. I had 1 Corinthians, but it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But as, as, you, as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we continue reading. We already read those other verses that we started in verse 16 of chapter 4. But as we keep reading here, I want you to see what the Apostle Paul goes on to say. And we'll start in verse 1. He says, For we know all, all that, that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. You know all those groanings, you know, when you're getting into the car sometimes, you're like, oh, yeah, that's groaning. You're just groaning for heaven. That's all it is. That's, that's, that's what it is. And you get up, Pastor Otto was talking about, I couldn't get, I couldn't get, he was just groaning forever. Like, oh my God. That, that's what, it, you're gro- you, don't, you don't realize this, but you're very spiritual in those moments, right? Yeah. <sighs> Just don't curse in those moments and keep it holy, all right? Just, ah, oh, you know, just, any, anyway, groan, so, so, so we're groaning, right? We're, we're groaning to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, speaking of our, our physical bodies, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, and we don't want to be naked, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared for us, prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are well confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Remember the, the apostle Paul was talking in Philippians. He was, he, he was like, I don't know if I should stay or go, you know, to stay is good for you, but I'd rather be. So, so here, here's, here's why I bring this up. Because first of all, when we think about our death, right? Again, when we think about death, we, 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 don't, we don't know exactly what to expect, but, but the Bible gives us some pretty clear expectations. Now, now I want to I point this out, and, and um, somebody asked, asked me this question, and so I want to address it. I said that I would address it here today. There are some different camps of belief when it comes to what happens when we die, right? So there, there are some people, they believe in what, that, that we enter into what has been referred to as soul sleep. Basically, you take a long nap until the resurrection. I don't know. I don't see that in the scriptures. But anyway, there it is. There, 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 that, that we're going to, we, we, we'll die and, and I, I guess it's because they like naps, right? So they enjoy naps and they're like, well, it'd be pretty cool to take a nap until, you know, judgment time, right? Like, that'll be fine. Okay, but, but, but that's not what the scriptures teach. I don't think so, right? Then there's some, as you can see that I think this, that we go immediately into the presence of God and are conscious, engaging in worship, awaiting the resurrection or rapture and our glorified bodies. And so that's, that's what I think the text teach, or the text teaches us about when we die, what happens. Every reference, now, now the reason where you get this idea of soul sleep, right, is, it, it, and, and it's not new, it's like three, 305 uh, um, a, um, AD that somebody wrote, a, wrote a, a document or something like that and they, you know, argued for this position of soul sleep. And then like in the 1800s is when it got really popular. And then there was a big division in the church and the seven day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses are the ones who espouse this belief in general. But, but, but that, that, that's, where, that's where the belief is. But, but it wasn't like this big belief that the church believed that. Because what? Because every reference that they're using to sleeping, like those who are sleeping in the Lord, you'll hear me read when we do communion. Some of you are sick and some of you are asleep. And I always point out that doesn't mean taking a nap. That means dead. But when someone dies physically, what do they look like they're doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. So, so, so you would use that term as a euphemism. You would use that term just to, just to, you know, it looks like they're sleeping. Those who are asleep in the Lord. It's not saying that they're taking any, uh, a nap until sometime. No, it's that, it's, it's that their body is in, is in a state of sleep, right? So there, there would be, so that's what they use there. Ecclesiastes, you can write this verse down. Ecclesiastes 12, seven says clearly that the spirit returns to God who gave it. 
There's no reference to a time of sleeping in between that. In this passage, the Apostle Paul, again, verse 8, very clearly, we are confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, to be in God's presence. There's a lot of other scriptures we could go to. In, the, in, in Jesus' parable, you remember Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31? It's a parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember that parable? What happens when they die? Well, Lazarus is taken, he's taken to the bosom of Abraham, right? To to this place of rest, what what would be called paradise today. He's taken to this place of rest, but but, but the rich man is in a place of torment. How do we know this? Because there's a whole conversation going on between him and Abraham. I guess they're not taking a nap, or maybe they just woke up. Anyway. The rich man and Lazarus show us, uh, and so, so what about our bodies? So they had some kind of body. Now, this isn't the resurrected body because the resurrected body, we know later on that that happens. Uh, First Thessalonians speaks about that. This resurrected body, our bodies will, re- will receive a glorified body. But, but we, we are in some kind of physicality in that place because they're, both of them are conscious. They're having a conversation. Body parts are spoken of. Let Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, right? And, and the bosom of Abraham, right? So there's body parts that are described. So anyway, here's the point. There seems to be sufficient reason to believe that immediately after we breathe our last breath, we will instantly be aware of either our suffering or our comfort, which should motivate us to be well-pleasing to the Lord. What does Paul say in verse nine? Verse nine, he says, therefore, because of this belief, because I believe that I'm gonna be immediately in the presence of God, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we, we persuade men, but we are well-known to God, and I also trust are well-known in your, conscience, in your consciences. And so what does the apostle Paul say? He says, man, we make it our aim. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. Now, what the apostle Paul is not saying, he's not saying, hey, we want to be pleasing to the Lord because that's going to guarantee entrance into heaven. No. What the apostle Paul knows is that if my life is not well pleasing to the Lord, that questions if I'm his at all. So what it is, is that I'm making sure that I'm living, not for my glory, not for my honor, but for his glory. Second thing I want you to repeat after me is this. Say, we will rejoice in the eternal unveiled presence of God. We will rejoice in the eternal unveiled presence of God. Now, this is the exciting part uh, to me uh, of the sermon in a big way because we get to walk through uh, Revelation chapter 21 and 22. We're gonna walk through these verses together and we're gonna do it quick. Like I said, I'm not gonna sit here and try to expound every single thing. I will pause and make commentary because it's impossible for me not to pause and make commentary. But nonetheless... We will rejoice in the eternal unveiled presence of God. When we look at these passages in Revelation, our eschatology is called into question. What do we believe by, by eschatology? What, is our, what, what do we believe about the end times? And so I like the way one author puts it, and I think that this is where I would land. Now, right now, is the church. This is the age of the church. In the millennium, it shall be the kingdom. That's when the kingdom will be established for those thousand years. And then after that shall be the new world wherein God will be all in all. So, so, so right now we are in the church age looking forward to the millennium time, but we're really looking forward to the end when all things are made new. So we're encouraged for eternity. God's dwelling will be among men, but what are we promised? So I hope you turn to Revelation chapter 21. 21. We'll start there in verse one. And look what he says. Now, this is after all the stuff has happened in Revelation, all the bowls, all the judgments, everything has already occurred. Great, great white throne judgment has already happened. And then he says this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, 
for these things are true and faithful. So what's the first thing we see? Complete freedom from the curse. New heavens and new earth. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more discomfort. The earth is not overheating. It's not too cold. Hello. The earth has no more issues. Everything is made beautiful again. That's the first thing that we look forward to. We see this crystal clear. The second thing, looking at verse 6 and going down to verse 8, and he, he, he talks about this new heavens and this new earth. He talks about the, the new Jerusalem. We won't look at that yet, but we, the new Jerusalem, the holy city of God, the place where God reigns from, rules from. All of this is, is restored and established. Then in verse 6, he says, and he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We shall be the people of God. There is coming a day where we are going to drink of the, uh, of the waters of life that we partake of now, right? Because when the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us, the Holy Spirit, we experience the rivers of life now, but we're going to experience it in fullness and glory. Right now is just a foretaste. That's all it is. Right now is the appetizer, praise the Lord. That's what, that, that, that's what this is now. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, we are, we are experiencing the appetizer. You know when you go into the food court at the mall, and you know there's, that, 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 there's usually somebody that's standing out there, they have a, a plate in their hand with little toothpicks, and they're like, here you go. What do they want you to do? They want you to, they, they want you to stop. They want you to, they want you to taste this and then say, you know what? Wherever I was going, I'm stopping. I got to stop here. Now, if you already had your mindset on something else, you're going to be like, no, 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 thank you. I'm good. I'm going to keep going. But if you're hungry, right, you'd be like, man, this is a free meal real quick. Let me just go ahead and let me walk a couple times by them or whatever. Anyway. <laughs> be like, Don't, you haven't stopped yet. I'm still making up my mind. Can I just get another take? But, <laughs> but what they're doing is they're whetting your appetite for what you could have if you just stand in this line and buy this food. What does our God do? He does the same thing, except... He doesn't say, hey, come stand in this line and buy this stuff. What he says is, I've already paid the price. Come and buy food without money. Come, come, come and drink without money. Come on. I already paid this price. I want you to taste it now. I want you to know of my goodness. I want you to know of my love. I want you to know of my peace. I want you to know of my joy. I want you to know that. I want you to taste it, but I want you to taste it. And hopefully it will be so good to you that you will turn. See, here's what you got to do. You got to leave your life. You've got to lay your life down so you can enter in to the rest that is there for you. So what do we see? He goes on, verse 8, very important, because he doesn't ignore this and, and, and all of this encouragement, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So what does he do? First thing that we see clearly, complete freedom from the curse, new heavens and new earth. The second thing that we see, consequence of the curse. So even though the heavens are made new and everything is new, there are still the consequence of the curse. The unrepentant will suffer the full wrath of God. That's it. He's reminding us, hey, I'm showing you all this beautiful stuff, but don't, don't forget, this isn't some universal thing that just, you know, everybody's going to be there. No, no, no. There are people who will be in the new heavens and the new earth, and there are people who will not. He makes it clear. Goes on, verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Again, you saw Jerusalem earlier. You see it here again. Descend descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her light was like the, a, a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. 
Also, he had a great, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates 12, and 12 angels at the gates and, the, and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed in the, to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city for, with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its walls, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall, walls was of jasper, and the city was, was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the walls of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardinox, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were, tw uh, were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the streets of the city, or the street of the city, was pure gold like transparent glass. You ain't seen bling like this ever, ever. There is nothing that you have seen. Now, now, now I, I, um, Pastor Rick, he posted some pictures uh, and, and, and he showed the immensity of these trees. And, and man, that is breathtaking stuff, right? Like you, I mean, there's some glorious stuff that we can see on the earth. Our family, we went to the Grand Canyon and, and, and looking over the, uh, the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's amazing. It's mind blowing. I remember being in Colorado the first time we went and I actually was able to ski. Hallelujah. And, and I was up on this mountain the, the last day coming down. And, 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 and because it takes so long, because a mountain, is so massive as I'm there I'm weeping as I'm skiing because I'm I'm overwhelmed by the creation of God not the fact that I was skiing but 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 anyway I was <laughs> it was a combination I was like thank you Lord for this but you know I, I was I was overwhelmed by this when 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 Lewis and I were in the car like we're driving into now mind you I'm from Florida y'all I ain't seen mountains like that we're driving in, and, and every mountain I see, I'm like, Lou, you got to take a picture. You got to take, because I'm driving, so I'm like, I can't drive and picture at the same time. And he's like, man, he's like, you know what? He wasn't even excited. You know why? He was like, pictures are not going to do justice for what we're seeing. And, and it's true, because when you're there and you look at the picture, like, man, this doesn't do the same thing that it did when I was there. Because it, it just doesn't take your breath away until you are in it. The, the, this is this is the description that 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 John is giving. John is giving being given this picture to see this glorious city. Now, mind you, this is a city that is inside of this glorious new creation. Creation is still there, and then there's this one place where God is going to dwell. So that's the third thing. There, the covenant city is restored. God's covenant people are unified perfectly in eternity. Jews and Gentiles alike, we're all together. We are the bride of the lamb. We are there. We are there with God in his presence. That's what we look forward to. Again, nothing we can have on this earth is going to compare. It goes on, verse 22. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the lamb are its temple. Notice, no, no, notice the shift. Right now, we are the dwelling place of God in the new heavens, in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem, God is our dwelling place. He, we, we dwell in him. He, it's, it's not, it, it, now it's not the spirit of God dwelling in us. It's us dwelling in his presence. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Notice there's still nations that are obviously here on the earth because they're bringing glory and honor into this particular temple. But there shall be no mean, by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
So we have a city that is full of bling and we have a temple that is full of glory. Oh, we, we know that when, when we start singing that song and, and, and you know, we're, we're singing about, you know, we crown you and we, we fall face down and we, and we think about the words of Christ. I don't know about you, man, but that stirs me inside of my heart in such a deep way. I, I, I'm, I'm picturing myself there around the throne of God as we see earlier on in Revelation, as we see in Isaiah. I'm, I'm thinking about those scenes and I'm like, man, I'm entering into this. And, and there's an overwhelmingness of, of God's presence that, that, that I'm sensing and, and Man, but nothing, nothing that we experience this side of heaven can compare to the glory that is coming. This is what we live for. And lastly, so communion with God is unhindered. God's unveiled glory and presence are experienced. And then lastly, Revelation 22, one through five says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Again, there's nations involved in eternity in the new heavens and new earth. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face. Moses was told nobody could see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads, will be sealed by the Lord. And there shall be no light there. They shall need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. But look at this last part of the, of the verse. And they shall reign forever and ever. Continual kingdom reign, the eternal gracious reign of God is established. So again, we will worship the king. We will worship the Lord in eternity, but we will also reign on the earth with him. What are we reigning? How is it reigning? I don't know, but all I know is I'm looking forward to it. Hello. There's no more sorrow at that time. There's no more heartache. So the reigning should be pretty easy. Glory to God. I have to judge between righteousness and unrighteousness. Why? Because God has already made all of those things clear. But we look forward to that. That's what we're looking forward to. So anyway, what I would say about this is reading Revelation should not strike fear and horror in, your, in the believer's heart. It should inspire awe. It should instill urgency and intensify our devotion to the Lord while we live on this earth. That's what should happen when we are in the scriptures. Now I'm going to turn to one more verse here for the third point. Say this with me. We must rejoice, we must rejoice. in the accessible presence of God. We will rejoice in the immediate presence of God. And we, we look forward to being in his unveiled presence. But right now, what are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be doing right now? Right? We, we ought to rejoice in who he is. But turn with me to Hebrews. This is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament regarding the church. And, and many of us don't even realize that this is talking about the church. But, 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 but going to Hebrews chapter 12 and go to verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Here's what it says. But you, speaking to the people of God, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, I want to just pause for a moment. You notice Jerusalem, you, you heard Jerusalem three times in, in the readings that we've done so far, right? Jerusalem is pretty important to the Lord, I would assume, because he's always repeating it. It's the place of peace, right? It's a place in which he reigns. There's a heavenly Jerusalem that we need to be concerned about, right? That we need to be focused on, right? I, I'm not saying ignore the earthly Jerusalem, but what I'm saying is that our hope is in a, in a Jerusalem that is eternal. That's where our hope is. That's where we should be focusing our attention. But we have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. We must rejoice in the accessible presence of God. This passage encourages us about what actually happens when we come together as the people of God. 
literally heaven and earth come together. That's what he's saying here. What does he tell us? Where, where, where have we come? We, we didn't come to Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, Old Testament, the thunderings, the lightnings, the fear, the terror, the people want to run from the Lord. They don't want to hear from God. We haven't come to that. We've come to Mount Zion. We've come to the holy hill of the Lord. We've come to the place where God welcomes us into his presence. So unlike the Old Testament gathering on Mount Sinai, which was marked by terror, we are invited into a festal gathering. Literally, a, a gathering of saints. The General Assembly is talking about that. It's this gathering. It's this, heavenly, uh, it's this heavenly assembly of the people of God that come together. A public festival for celebration is the analogy that is there. Consisting of what? Who's here when we gather for worship? If core faith not your church, when you gather with the people of God, you are not just coming into a building that is hot or a building that is cold or a place where they have loud music or a place where they have low music or a place where the preacher preaches for 20 minutes or the preacher preaches for two hours. You're not, that, that's not just what you're coming to. You are gathering as the people of God and you are literally coming into the presence of almighty God. When we gather, this is why this is a sacred place. This is why on the outside we, we still call this a sanctuary. It is a place of holiness. It is a place where reverence should be because we are entering into the presence of God. We are coming to the holy city of God. We are coming to the mountain of God. We're coming into his presence, but not just in his presence alone, but we are coming to innumerable angels that are in the atmosphere with us. We are translated into that atmosphere as the people of God as we worship. We come before God as the judge. What, what happens when we come together? We come before the one who executes his judgment. Things happen when the people of God come together and they're praying and they're worshiping and they're seeking the Lord. Well, guess what? God is executing his judgment. He is saying freedom. He is saying you're bound. He is saying you can be healed. Judgments are happening when the people of God gather together. We're coming together with the general assembly. And then here's my last point for those who think that soul sleep is still a thing, because it says clearly with the spirits of just men made perfect, when we gather, this is, this is why this is so special, because when we gather Every saint that has died, that is asleep in the Lord, is gathered with us in worship. Now listen, we can't have a conversation with them, but we can join them in worship. And we know because the scriptures say that when we come to God, we are worshiping together, not just with the people in the room, with the angels of heaven and with the, the spirits of just men made perfect. And how do we do all of this? Well, we do all of this because of the blood of Christ, which makes it all possible. Our gatherings are only possible because of the one who shed holy blood. Why did he shed holy blood? Because without his blood, we could not access God. We couldn't come to God apart from the bloody sacrifice of our Savior. That is why we preach the gospel every week. We want people to know that we are separated from God because of our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience. And if it is up to us, we will die in hell and experience the second death that the Bible speaks of. But Jesus intercedes. He intervenes. He comes and he dies to redeem us and to ensure that we can be in the presence of God for eternity, but know this, he doesn't just save us from our sin and our rebellion and say, hey, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. He saves us to himself now. He gives us a foretaste now, and here's what I truly believe. We will experience as much of God this side of heaven as we will allow him to allow us to experience. It's up to us. You can keep God at arm's length and be like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really want that. You can keep walking by his offers. Or you can say, God, I'm yours. And I want as much of you as I can have. As we wait for the Lord, I'm wrapping up right now. As we wait for the Lord to return or, or to come to us in death, we have, we have been assured of the access to his presence. This is a guarantee. You should, listen, you should read this every Saturday night. You should read this every Sunday morning. You should sit down there during prayer time. I know all of you love to come to prayer time. Hallelujah. 
You should be there at prayer time at 9.30. You should be sitting there with this scripture opened up. And, and listen, I'm busting your chops. You know that. But, but, but listen, I want you to come pray. I want you to come and be present. But you should sit down there and you should meditate on this scripture. You should pray, God, let us experience the fullness of what this scripture says. Let, let, let us as the people of God recognize that we have been translated into the presence of the King of Kings, that we are in his presence, that we would know him in his fullness, that we would experience the power of the redeeming blood of Christ, that we would even be able to know that we're rejoicing next to loved ones who have gone before us and that in this moment we are gathered together. We should rejoice in those things. Church, why is this important? Not just for Saturday night or Sunday morning, but we, but we must avail ourselves to this to ensure that our hearts stay fixed on eternity and that they don't get stuck or choked up by the cares of this life. If we don't believe this, we think this is all this is. If we, if we don't believe this, we think that this kind of stuff is our only hope. Friends, act up the right way, do the things you should do. Be a voice of righteousness, but your hope better not be in this world. Your, your, your hope better not be in, in, in who's in the White House. Your hope better not be, uh, you know, well, what, what, what gets passed in legislation. That better not be your final hope. You do everything you can, you, you can to make sure righteousness is established in this earth, but make sure you know, man, you're saved for something so much greater than this earth. That doesn't mean disengage. That simply means don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. So here's my closing question for you. I'm gonna give you some homework. First Peter chapter three, verse 13 through 17. First Peter chapter three, 13 through 17. I want you, I want you to meditate on that scripture along with this Hebrews passage. Well, my question for you is, does your life Reflect a hope that people want to ask you about. When people see your life, when people, when people, when, when people talk to you, when, when people engage with you, do they see that your life has hope? Like, 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 like you have a hope that is outside of your job. Like you have a hope that is outside of your spouse. Like you have a hope that is outside of your doctors. You, you have a hope that is outside of this world. Does your life have that? Or are you so caught up in this world, so caught up in this life, so caught up in what is going on here that nobody even knows that you think about heaven? And maybe it's because you don't think about heaven. But my hope is that you will think greatly about heaven. That, that, that you will be a kingdom citizen that is living in this world for God's glory, but for the glory that is to come. Let's all stand. We started this series with the song that Minister Hector is going to lead us in. And I want us to just sing this song to the Lord. And then we'll come together and we'll do communion. But where's your heart? Where's your heart? Do you have the hope of heaven or not? Like, not just that you know it, but man, like it's here. Like, man, it's like I'm looking forward. I'm going to be sad to leave the people on this earth. I'm going to be sad not to see everything that I hope to see in this earth. But man, I would rather that Jesus came right now than I have to live one more day apart from his presence. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just wanna say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes, thank you for the shares, thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word. 
Core Faith to 73256. That is Core Faith, one word, to 73256, and then follow the prompts, and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that God has given us. And if you are supporting us financially, I want to say thank you so much. I pray that God will bless you abundantly. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.